Hi, welcome to the next of our series of video lectures on practical electromagnetics for engineers. Today we're going to give you a brief introduction to Smith charts. Um, let's talk about Smith charts a little bit before we get into it. Um, Smith charts are a graphical method for solving equations, and we've got essentially a stable of equations um, that we can use to represent uh, lossless transmission lines. The, the equations are pretty simple. We assume we're given some kind of source, and that source is everything over on this side of this line. We assume we know some kind of load determined by an impedance, everything on that side of the line. We have some transmission line with a characteristic impedance, a frequency, and a phase velocity. Um, it turns out we can calculate the propagation coefficient beta pretty easily if we're given the phase velocity and the frequency. Uh, we know the solution of the w waves on this line are a voltage wave and a current wave moving in the positive and negative directions. It turns out that if we know the load and the uh, characteristic impedance, we can calculate the reflection coefficient gamma over here. Um, and with that reflection coefficient, we can calculate the impedance of the line or the ratio between the voltage and the current anywhere along the line given this expression here. And this is important because that input impedance determines the power and we can calculate the incident reflected and, and power at the load once we know these other things. The problem with these equations is you can see that they all contain complex numbers. Um, and that, that gets, a little, uh, gets a little tricky, actually. There should be some complex numbers up in here um, to make those technically correct. So let's add those. But, but these all contain complex numbers. Um, and so if you're doing this without the help of a, a calculator or better yet, a computer, they become really tedious to do. So this guy named Smith back in the 1930s developed a graphical method for solving equations. And Smith charts are kind of like, um, or Smith charts are to transmission lines what slide rules are to computers. Um, it's a really easy ac but inaccurate way to do things. And we don't use Smith charts that much anymore because we have computers, but a lot of things are displayed in Smith chart notation. So you need to know where they come from. You need to know how to plot an impedance on a Smith chart, which is the point of this letter. Smith charts look like this. And so what they've essentially done, as we'll see, is they've taken the, the complete space of complex numbers, and they've done something called map that to this circle. So every single combination of, of, of characteristic impedance and load impedance can be plotted on this one circle by doing a mathematical mapping. And so let's understand what a mapping is. A mapping takes one space into another space through some kind of operation. And we're going to use this a lot as we learn more about electromagnetics. So, so let's explore a simple example of mapping. Um, we're going to show a, the, an example of mapping that's a game. And the game's given by these simple rules. You and a friend are going to take turns picking a number from 1 to 9. You can only use a number once. And the first person who has any three numbers that add to 15 win. You can't have two. That doesn't count. You can't have four or more. Three numbers have to add to 15. Um, and if you can't pick a number that adds to 15 or less, uh, you abandon the numbers and start your game over again, essentially. So, so let's see how this works. Um, let's do an example. Let's have um, basically a player we'll call Anna and a player Tom. And uh, they flip a coin, and Tom gets to go first. So Tom chooses the number 4. So we'll cross that off the list because we can't reuse numbers. Um, Anna picks the number 8. That one's gone. Um, Tom's going to pick the number 6. So he's got 4 and 6. If he can choose a 5, he'll have three numbers that add to 15. Um, so Anna, being pretty smart, thinks, gee, I better take that 5. Um, so she has 13. Uh, Tom thinks to himself, gosh, 8 and 5 is 13. I better take the 2. That gives him a total of 12. Um, Anna's got 13. She can't use the 3, but she's going to block Tom because he's got 12. Um, Tom doesn't know what to do. Uh, gee, can I do 4 plus 7 plus... This gets a little bit confusing because once Tom picks, say, the number 7, now he's got 4 numbers and has to figure out how to make 15 out of 3 of them. So if you're going to play this game with a friend and win consistently and seem really smart, you need to take this, this linear number space and map it into something that makes the game easier. And the mapping algorithm we're going to use here 
is something called a magic square. And this is a magic square right here. It turns out that you can arrange the numbers from 1 to 9 into a square so that any row or column or diagonal adds up to 15. And you can see this by just taking a row, and you can see any of these rows is going to sum up to 15. Any diagonal, essentially, 8 plus 5 plus 2 adds up to 15. And this is known as a magic square. So how does this help us? What we've done is we've taken this linear row of numbers, mapped it onto the magic square, so that any sum is going to be our game condition. What if we represent our magic square a different way? Let's put it onto this expression right here. This actually looks like a different type of game, um, one that, that you've seen a lot when you were in elementary school, and you probably gave up playing about the time you were in fifth or sixth grade because you learned it got boring. And the game is tic-tac-toe. So mapping this number game onto a tic-tac-toe board turns out to make this game much easier. Um, in this case, Anna picks five. We'll get, make her the X's. Tom picks six. Anna picks nine. Tom knows he has to pick one to block. Um, Anna wants to block. She picks eight. Uh, Tom picks two. Anna picks seven. And you can already see that Tom's going to pick three next, and the game's going to be a stalemate. So what have we seen here? We've seen that through a mapping operation, by being clever about things, we can take one space that seems very complex into a space that's much more intuitive to work with. We do this all the time in, in engineering, especially electrical engineering. We move from the time domain space to the frequency domain space through Fourier transforms. In electromagnetics, we move from one coordinate system, say the Cartesian rectilinear coordinate system, into spherical coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, as we'll see later on. Um, and the Smith chart is another one of these mapping spaces. Essentially what it does is it creates the space of the reflection coefficient. We know reflection coefficients can be complex, but we know that always the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is between, uh, not the magnitude, but we know the reflection coefficient is between negative 1 and 1, and the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is thus less, or, less than or equal to 1. On the Argand diagram, the complex plane, we know that every single reflection coefficient, if we were to plot it, would fit between negative 1 and 1 on the real axis, positive j, or i if you're a physicist, and negative j on the complex axis. And so everything fits inside this circle, because this circle is essentially where the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is equal to 1. Well, this is our Smith chart, essentially. Um, essentially what we're going to do is we're going to say, g. I can take my load and line impedances, um, ZL and Z naught, and I can calculate my reflection coefficient from them. If I just do a little bit of algebra by dividing both the numerator and the denominator by Z naught, I come up with this expression right here. And so I can plot what we call a normalized impedance, where we divide it by the characteristic impedance of the line as a reflection coefficient. And when we do this mathematical operation right here on any impedance, we can plot it on the Smith chart, just like that. Now, I know this is confusing. You really have to see some examples for this to work. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, it turns out that when we have our load impedance is equal to our line impedance, perfectly matched, um, that the mapping on the reflection coefficient, as we've seen, is zero. And that maps right here on the Smith chart. Um, as we start to move to more, more positive or larger real numbers, we move out this way. This, you can't see this very well, but there's 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 1.6, 1.8. A real part is right of, of 2 is right there. It turns out that as we go this direction, we get positive imaginary numbers. As we go this direction, we get negative imaginary numbers. Smaller real numbers are right there. So let's take a look at an example of this. Um, let's say Z load is equal to 75 ohms. Z naught 
is equal to 50 ohms. And let's plot this on our Smith chart right here after we get rid of some of the rest of this junk. How would we plot this load impedance on the Smith chart? Well, it turns out that Z load over Z naught is equal to what? 75 over 50 or 3 over 2, which is 1.5. So the way we'd plot this, since it's purely real, is on the real axis, which is this horizontal axis right here, and it has a value of 1.5, which although you can't see these little numbers, turns out to be right here. Let's take a look at a complex load impedance. Z load is equal to um, 80 minus J 60. Well, if we say in this case Z naught is equal to 40 ohms, then Z load over Z naught is equal to 80 over 40 minus J 60 over 40, which is equal to 2 minus 1.5 J. 2 corresponds right there on the real axis. J goes negative here, so we move along these lines on the Smith chart right here until we find the line that's 1.5, and it actually turns out to be this line right here. So the way we find it is we take our 2, we drive along this way until it intersects, and this point right here is equal to 2 minus 1.5 J. Let's look at one more example. Let's say Z load is equal to 75 plus 100 J. Um, Z naught in this case is equal to 50 ohms. Then simply by doing this math we get 3 over 2 plus 2 times J, and so again, we move on our Smith chart until we find a value of 1.5 in the positive real direction, which turns out to be right here. We also find where positive 2 is, draw this line over this way, follow it in, draw this line over this way, follow it in. This point right here is how we'd represent a load impedance of 75 plus 100 J if the line impedance was 50 ohms. Um, let's say Z naught in this case is 25 ohms and we keep our load impedance. Now we have 3 plus 4J. We'd take it, we'd move till we find the value 3 which is here. We would find the value 4 in the positive direction which is here. Draw along that line, draw along that line. If we change Z naught to be 25 this point right here is the new value of the load on the Smith chart. So hopefully from this you've got a sense of how you can plot loads on a Smith chart. Um, this is the most we're going to go into it. There's a lot more you can do moving around this circle and doing kinds of cool stuff. So you can look on the web if you need to find that.